Mick Steele wasn't fancy cars or Porsches or Jaguars or anything like that. He had his own truck where he'd done his own engineering work. You know, he wasn't, you know, the big drug baron. He, that wasn't Mickey Steele. Craig Rolfe made his way from Essex to Golders Green to meet Black Gary, one of North London's top drug dealers. Having picked up his share of Steele's cannabis, Rolfe was anxious to turn it into hard cash as quickly as possible, and Gary was the man for the job. The deal was as straightforward as could be. The price per kilo worked out at an even £10,000 for the lot, with Rolf's personal profit coming in at around £6,000. It would have been more, but still, insisting that the risks were greater since his brush with customs pushed up the price for his importation service, something that had pissed off Tucker and particularly Tate no end. No money was changing hands between Rolf and Black Gary that day. Instead, the cannabis was being laid on, and Gary would pass over the money as soon as he sold the drugs. It meant that Rolf would have to wait a little longer to get paid, but the drugs were out of his hands in one fell swoop, and they didn't have to run the risk of being done for possession. All he had to do now was sit back and wait. Elsewhere in Essex, Darren Nichols was also waiting for the money to start rolling in. He had dozens of buyers waiting for the latest consignment of cannabis to arrive, and the three kilos he'd taken from Steel had all gone in a couple of hours. Pleased with himself for having done a good day's work, Nichols was preparing himself for a long, hard Saturday night down the pub when the first call came in. Darren Nichols was not alone. A furious black Gary got on the phone to Craig Rolfe less than an hour after their meeting to tell him that he wouldn't be getting a penny as the cannabis was totally unsellable. Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Peter Corey had also received complaints. And as with Nichols, the situation was getting out of hand. Nichols phoned Steele again and tried to break the bad news as gently as possible. He slowly explained the biggest drug shipment Steele had been involved in since getting back into smuggling. The one he'd almost been caught bringing into the country by customs had been a complete waste of time. Steele went ballistic. Pat Tate was starting to feel the pinch. The business with the bad cannabis was really starting to hurt. Contacts he had spent years nurturing were now thinking twice about dealing with him. Just in case, they too ended up with a duff load. In his twisted, drug-aided mind, there was only one possible explanation for the whole mess. Michael Steele. The man he'd once considered a friend, and whom he trusted with his money, was trying to rip him off. Tate was also worried by the fact he'd passed on some of the duff puff to the Joneses brothers, the men who had lent him the money to get into the deal in the first place. They, not surprisingly, had been furious when the goods turned out to be unsellable and they had sent some of their heavies round with orders to bring Tate before them but he could explain himself or face the consequences. As he stood before the impromptu kangaroo court, Tate explained that the bad cannabis had been entirely down to Michael Steele. In order to prove that he was telling the truth, he made the brothers a solemn promise. I will bring Steele here and I'll make him get down on his knees and beg forgiveness for trying to rip you off, Tate explained. And then, when you've had enough, I'll put a gun to his head and blow his fucking brains out. The explanation was accepted, but it still left a small matter of the money that Tate owed. So far as the Joneses were concerned, a deal was a deal. They'd given him £40,000 and he'd promised them £50,000 back. Tate promised he would get the money just as soon as he could. The Joneses gave him one month. Even the most laid-back member of the firm was feeling distinctly uncomfortable. Normally, Tony Tucker was so distant from any actual drugs sold in the club that it wouldn't have been a problem, but Raquel's was different. The main dealer there, Mark Murray, had suffered a string of police raids on his employees, losing more than 250,000 pills, worth more than £40,000 in just a few weeks. It meant he hadn't been able to pay Tucker his usual rent, and he'd gone into the red. A compromise was reached. Tucker would supply Murray with his ecstasy direct, with Murray buying the pills at twice the usual rate in order to make up for the debt. Murray reluctantly agreed. He had long realised that it made good business sense to sell tablets that were weak as possible. They cost the same, but it meant the punters would buy two or three ease during the course of an evening, and his profits would be far higher. Tucker's pills were much stronger, so strong that one would let you rave all night long. It would take forever for Murray to repay his debt, but Tucker was determined to get his money back, so he had no choice. 
The problem Tucker was facing was that everybody knew his pills were the apples that Leah had taken and that everybody was now talking about. And it was only a matter of time before the police found that out too. Tucker was certain that he was going to be betrayed. Everybody around him became a potential grass. Every knock on the door was a potential raid. Tucker, very much the brains behind the organisation, was starting to let it all get to him. The paranoia was highly infectious. By the time Darren Nichols arrived at Steele's house early on Monday evening, the master smuggler's mood had gone from bad to worse. As Steele and Nichols chatted, Steele's mobile phone rang. It was Dopey Harris who proceeded to explain there had been a terrible accident, that the wrong boxes had been put in the car. Harris insisted, however, that at least one of the boxes, around a third of the total drug consignment, had been good stuff. Steele told him, in no uncertain terms, that unless things got sorted and quickly, he was going to pass on Harris's address to Tate, Tucker and Rolf. He would come over and sort it out in person. Probably by smashing the fuck out of his bar, and then smashing the fuck out of him. Harris quickly agreed that if Steele returned all the drugs, he would get all his money back. Steele passed the message on, and over the next few hours, the cannabis started to filter back. Most of his customers were a little annoyed, but willing to forgive and forget, especially with the promise of a full refund. Tate, however, was still in a fit of temper about the whole affair, and massively frustrated about the Leah Betts thing. He smashed each and every slab with a hammer before delivering it back to Steele. We also held back some of the drugs, telling Steele he'd only return them when he had his money in his hand. It didn't take Steele long to work out that Tate was holding back roughly a third of the whole shipment, the same amount that Stone had insisted was good. There could only be one conclusion. Tate was trying to rip him off. Early on Tuesday morning, DCI's story put his plan into action and raided Pat Tate's flat in Swanstead, where Tucker's mistress Donna Garwood was living. A small quantity of amphetamines was found, and Garwood spent a few hours in the cells before a few men Tucker arrived to bail her out. There were a bit of a raids across Basildon that morning too, most of them friends of Leah's or Bagman some way down the drug supply chain. But for Tucker the message was clear, they were on to him. He had an emergency meeting with Tate and Rolf about what they were going to do. Then the firm had its first lucky break. Steve Packman and Stephen Smith had been arrested and charged with supplying the tablets. The police had their result and the public had their scapegoat. All the firm had to do was wait for Steele to sort out the cannabis deal and everything would be sweet as a nut once more. After Steele had sorted out the cannabis deal in Amsterdam, the members of the London firm were preparing to go to Ostend to collect the money. Tony Tucker had decided to drop out at the last minute. It was the day before his birthday and as a treat his living lover Anna had arranged a surprise night at a London hotel. Tucker had no interest in cancelling it. Besides, it wasn't as if the job wasn't so difficult that Rolf and Tate couldn't handle it on their own. The firm needed as many people as possible to help bring back the cash. That way, each person would be carrying a reasonably small amount, so that if they were stopped by customs, they wouldn't look too suspicious. Rolf had asked his girlfriend, Donna Jaggers, but she didn't like the sound of it and turned him down. It wasn't so much the trip to collect the money that she objected to, it was another bigger job that Rolf had started to mention that was simply getting much too serious for her liking. Craig had told me that Steele had approached Tate and asked him to nick someone else's gear from them. Steele had been asked by a London gang to import 30 kilos of cocaine and was going to fly it over from Holland. It told Pat Tate he had been given £50,000 up front and bring the cocaine back with a member of the London gang in the passenger seat. The idea was that Tate and Tucker would rob the firm of the cocaine once it arrived over here. Tate suggested they share it between them and had told the firm who planned to land it in a field near Clacton. In fact, Steele was actually going to land in a South Essex field where Tate and the others would be waiting. A week or so earlier, Craig, Tony and Pat had obtained a machine gun from a man called Mad Mick. It had been handed over at a meeting at the Granada Motorway Services in Essex for £300. They were planning to use the gun on the man from the London firm in order to take the cocaine. I didn't know how far they were planning to go when they robbed the firm, but they knew they had to make sure the gun worked. Rolf and Tucker had already used the gun to spray bullets into the car of a man threatening to give evidence against Tucker in a forthcoming assault case. I'd put some extra ventilation holes in the door and windows. They knocked on the man's door. Next time, you'll be inside it, they said. 
then left. By now, Jaggers was getting increasingly nervous herself and terrified that her and Rolf were going to be arrested at any time. She hoped that if she refused to go to Amsterdam, that Rolf might pull out. Instead, she found her boyfriend was really excited at the prospect of a night on the tiles in a foreign country with no one to tie him down, and he looked forward to going even more. Rolf took his Range Rover and picked up Tucker's other girlfriend, Donna Garwood, Tate, Tate's girlfriend, Izzy Fletcher, and her friend, Gaynor. To make up the numbers, Tate also asked his car dealer friend Barry Dorman to come along and he agreed to follow in a separate car, bringing his girlfriend Danette to keep him company. The Range Rover was the first car in the convoy to arrive in Ostend. Tate left the others in a pub when he went to the entrance of the train station where he agreed to meet Steele. Garwood and the others watched from the distance as Tate and Steele returned to the pub and made their way to a quiet table in the corner where they talked about 20 minutes. When Steele got up to go, he passed over the bulging carrier bag and been holding to Tate. The transaction was complete. In the meantime, Darren Nichols was standing across the road from the pub, trying to shelter from the rain and waiting for Steele to reappear. When the pair had arrived in Ostend, Steele had booked into a hotel and sent Nichols off to the ferry terminal to buy a ticket. The idea was that it would take £20,000 back with him on the overnight ferry and that Steele would travel back to England the following morning once she had dished the rest of the money out to the others. As always, Stiller told Nichols to make himself scarce. He didn't want anyone to know who was on his team, just in case they tried to poach them or use his drug contacts. After 20 minutes of getting wet and watching the gang laughing and joking in the warm, dry pub, Steel eventually came out and Nichols called him over. On the 4th of December, Pat Tate was planning a quiet night in with Lizzie Fletcher, she called up the London Pizza Company in Basildon and asked the 21-year-old manager, Roger Ryle, for a pizza with different toppings on each quarter. Ryle told her that would not be possible. Suddenly, Tate grabbed the phone. You all deliver the pizza I fucking want or I'll come round here and get it. I wasn't going to take that, Ryle said later. So I said to him, get rid of the attitude and I will send you a pizza. What's your fucking name, screamed Tate. That made him worse and he slammed the phone down. Half an hour later, Tate turned up. Who's Roger? When Ryle put his hands up, Tate picked up the till and threw it at him. Ryle quickly backed out of the office and pushed the panic button as Tate vaulted the counter and rushed towards him. Punched him in the face and smashed my head up and down on the glass plate on the draining board. Blood steamed out of a wound in his head. Tate warned him not to call the police or he would return and smash the place up and beat up all the staff. But it was too late. The panic button brought officers, and Tate was traced to his home in Basildon. At first, Ryle, who had concussion, was determined to have the man who had assaulted him brought to justice. But as friends and colleagues told him more about Pat Tate's reputation, and that of the firm that he belonged to, Ryle's resolve softened. By the following morning, he'd withdrawn his statement, and decided not to press charges. Within the space of a few hours, the incident had become legend across South East Sussex. For some, it was testimony to Pat's increasing arrogance and influence that he could commit such a public crime and get away with it. There was a time when his strength, his wit and charm made him a valuable asset. But that was in the past. Now there was only one way to describe Pat Tate. A liability. <laughs>